Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask the Pastor. My name is Dr. Ron Archer, and I'm the Senior Servant Leader at the Places of Hope. And I just want to take a moment to thank Dr. Garth and Tina Coons for their vision and their hard work to make all this possible. Now, you know, this show cannot be what it is without you. We need you to call. So call us at 1-800-331-3552. Better yet, email us at Ask at tct.tv, and we're live on YouTube. YouTubers, give us a question. So bless you. Well, we have a great panel. You know, I call these guys the Fantastic Four. They are brilliant at exegesis, homiletics, and hermeneutics, and they know the Word of God. Let's introduce our panel today. We have Dr. James Baylark, pastor, First Community Baptist Church, Desert Hot Springs, California. Hello, Pastor. Next, we have Pastor John Ward, Word of Faith, Toronto, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Good day to you, sir. Next, we have Pastor Ryan Sutton, Pastor of the Grace Center, Festus. I like that name, Festus, Missouri. And then we have Pastor Doyle Passmore, Pastor of Lakeshore House of Prayer, Holland, Michigan. We have a lot to cover today. We have some dynamic questions, and we are excited about being on the best show on television. Well, let's begin today with asking our first question. This is from Robert from Arizona. Here is his question about John the Baptist. Why was John the Baptist beheaded? Pastor Baylark, you want to explain why he lost his head? It's a very good question, uh, Robert. And I think if you look at the scripture in Matthew's, in that 14th chapter, as well as Mark chapter 6, uh, Herdias, the wife of King Herod, at the Pius, was responsible for persuading her husband to behead John the Baptist. And the reason for that is John the Baptist had rebuked King Herod for divorcing his wife and marrying his niece. Herodias, and who had been a brother of Philip's wife, and Herod married the Herodias with a violation of God's law. If you look at Leviticus chapter 18 uh, and verse 16 and 20 and verse 21. And so we see that, that these are the things that basically brought about the beheading of John the Baptist because he rebuked uh, what had been done and they didn't like it. And so they made it a priority Uh, to behead him and to take his life. Thank you for that biblical perspective. Well, Pastor Ward, why did John the Baptist lose his head? Who lost theirs for him to lose his? What happened? Tell us. It's a good point. So just to add on to what Dr. Baylark said, uh, you know, Herod was a man of great pride and he was embarrassed Um, because of his wife and his wife was angry because John the Baptist called him out and said, listen, what you're doing is sin. And John the Baptist was a bold man. He was full of of the righteousness of God. And he was not ashamed uh, to tell people and to call them out for their sins. Well, it got all the way up to his wife. His wife was angry. John uh, wanted to kill, excuse me, Herod wanted to kill John the Baptist, but he wouldn't do it because he was afraid of the people. But then he has this party and at the party he gets drunk Herodias' daughter dances before him. Obviously, they get all excited. And he says, I'll give you whatever you want. And she says, I want John the Baptist's head on a charger. And that's exactly what they did. They went into the prison, cut his head off, and served it up on a charger. And uh, he paid a great price for that at the end of his life. Wow, wow, wow. That's amazing. Well, Pastor Sutton, how did John the Baptist lose his head and why? What happened? Give us some more detail about this crazy story here. You know, Dr. Archer, I agree with, with Dr. Baylock and everything that Pastor Ward just said. It was because of his boldness to speak the truth to Herod. And I'll just add to it by saying this briefly. John the Baptist, you know, was a man that we need more people like John the Baptist today, men and women who are yes. not afraid to speak the truth in love, even when it, it costs us something. Because we're living in a time right now, Dr. Archer, where... Yes. There are many people trying to silence those who speak the truth. And so, you know, 
it cost him his head, but Jesus said, born among men, there's never been any greater than John the Baptist. Amen. Really good. Great, encouraging word. Uh, Pastor Passmore, what is your take on John the Baptist losing his head and why? Well, I think the pastors have answered very well on this. There were so many moving parts here, so many characters. And certainly uh, Herod's sin and lust was just uh, burning him up. The lust over his stepdaughter, this young woman who danced provocatively before him, and because of his drunkenness, because of his lust, it, uh, it did John in. But I have just a little bit more take on this than we talked about already. You recall that at one point it was said of John the Baptist. He, in fact, he said, I must decrease while mm. Christ must increase. And so really what we were seeing was we were seeing his ministry come to its end. And for every minister, the greatest of ministers, there's going to be an end day for each, each one of us, for each one of the great ones. Billy Graham, he was, wow. he had a last day. He was into yes. his 90s, but there was yes. a time. When, he, uh, when it was time for him to uh, leave this world as well. So Christ was increasing while yes. John the Baptist was decreasing. Amen. You know, I played football, and I was pretty good, but then I played basketball, I was horrible. Matter of fact, my nickname was Self-Check. When they gave me the ball, the crowd would go, no! But one of my teammates was so good, they put three guys on him. What's my word from this is that when you are living godly, when you're standing for Christ, when you're doing what's right, expect persecution. Expect people to come after you it's because they know you got game and you can score. So know it's a pr Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Okay, second question today is from Brendan, and he's asking about Matthew 12, 36. And his specific question is, what are idle words that are mentioned in this scripture? Pastor John Ward, you want to give Brendan some perspective on Matthew 12, 36, sir? Praise God. Great question. Um, first of all, let's read it in the New Living. And it says, and I tell you this, you must give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word you speak. This is a big subject. And the reason is, is we need to understand the word judgment. Here, the word judgment in the Greek is the word krisis, and it means condemnatory sentence. We need to understand a lot of people don't understand what the day of judgment is. First of all, Romans 8 1 says that there is therefore now no judgment to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now we are going to stand before God on the day of judgment, but it's not a condemnation judgment. It's what the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 10, 2 Corinthians 5 10, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This word judgment is the Greek word bema, and bema means the official's seat of authority. We are going to receive rewards and we are going to receive uh, accolades that come from the Lord based on things that we did. But when is the day of judgment? Well, in my last 21 seconds, 1 John 4, 17 says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The day of judgment is when Satan comes after you, when he accuses you. He's the accuser of the brethren. And Jesus said that we'll give an account for every idle word. When you speak God's word, the word that you speak of righteousness will bring you through when Satan attacks you. Oh, man, what a great biblical response to that question. Brendan is asking about idle words and what is mentioned in Scripture. Pastor Sutton, what is your take on Brendan's question, sir? Thank you for this question, Brendan. And I, I agree with everything Pastor John just said, and I'll just add to it. You know, idle words in Matthew twelve thirty six is speaking of, you know, claims of righteousness that did not exist. It's like Pastor John just said, there's no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, we have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. And when we try to puff ourselves up or claim that we're righteous because of our own works and our own good deeds, those are idle words because we're claiming righteousness that does not exist when we try to claim righteousness 
apart from the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So Jesus was just saying, you know, you're going to you're going to give an account for these words when you try to claim righteousness that doesn't exist that's mm. based on your own works. All of our righteousness is filthy rags Amen. in God's sight. We've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Pastor Passmore, what is your biblical counsel on Matthew 12, 36 for Brendan? I always recommend that people don't just take one verse and isolate that verse and try to build a doctrine. Look on the other sides of it as well. Jesus was talking to these uh, religious people, and he did not mince words. At one point, he called them plainly, you bunch of evil snakes, how can you say anything good? Good people, verse 35, good people bring good things out of their hearts, but evil people bring evil things out of their hearts. I promise you, Jesus says, I promise you that on the day of judgment, Everyone will have to give an account for every careless word they have spoken. On that day, listen to this, they will be told that they are either innocent or guilty because of the things that they have said. And, uh, you know, my mother, when I was growing up, she had favorite verses, and this was one of them that she spoke into me many times. If I maybe said a word that was just a little off color, I would never cuss or curse around her or anyone else. But I might say something that's just not quite right. It didn't suit her. Pentecostal cussing, my uh, friend Rod Lee calls it. (laughs) And she would warn me of that. She'd say, Doyle, don't you know you're going to be called into account for every idle word? So what you say is going to determine, are you important in the eyes of God or are you impotent in the eyes of God? Amen. Wise counsel. Well, uh, Dr. James Baylark, what is your counsel on Matthew 12, 36 uh, concerning idle words and what it means in Scripture? Now, this is a very, very good question, very good question. And I would just like to go along with Pastor John as well as Pastor Sutton and Pastor Doyle. Uh, but just to add, uh, in the Scripture, Jesus says unto the Pharisees, you must give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word that you speak. And the words that uh, you say either will acquit you or condemn you. Now, the the Mm. Greek word is ergos, which is translated as being idle or inactive, unfruitful, barren, lazy, and useless and unprofitable. And so these are things that you have to take in mind uh, when you look at the scripture. And then the word also is used to describe inactive work. If you look at Matthew's, Yes. Uh, chapter 20, verses 3 and 6, the young widow uh, who was a, a busybody and a gossiper who didn't care for the children or the home and yes. the good and creating. So, you know, these are the things that you look at. And so that's why the, the Bible says that we are to humble ourselves Hallelujah. before the Lord. And when we humble ourselves, then we dissipate and actually eliminate Amen. idle words. Amen. One great writer once said, it is one thing to be silent and thought a fool. It is something else to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Amen, men of God. Let's go on to the third question. Uh, now, this one, we, this never happens, right? The question is, how should Christians handle disputes? You mean Christians have disputes? Well, let's find out. Pastor Ryan Sutton, what is your counsel on how should believers, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the cowed out ones, how should they handle disputes? This is, this is an excellent question, Dr. Archer. And, you know, I'd just like to use several scriptures quickly during my time. I'll let these other men of God jump in. Matthew 18 says, Matthew 18, 15, moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he shall hear you, you have gained your brother. And Matthew 18, 16 says, but if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man or a publican. So the way that we handle disputes is by going to the person that is offended with us or upset with us and trying to reason with them. And if, if that can be resolved, praise the Lord. If not, go get someone else or a couple of other people, bring them along. If that still won't resolve it, 
then it needs to be shared publicly before the church. And I'll say this and be finished. In addition to Matthew 18 and, and what Jesus said, I believe Proverbs 15, 1, a soft and gentle answer turns away wrath, harsh words stir up anger. And then James 1, 19 says, let everyone be uh, slow to speak, swift to hear, and slow to wrath, Dr. Archer. And I believe Matthew Boy. 18, Proverbs 15, 1, and James 119 are great scriptures as it pertains to disputes among believers. Boy, do we need those scriptures today in our current environment. Well, Pastor Passmore, how should Christians handle disputes? Well, I love the scriptures that Pastor Sutton just gave. Matthew 18, that's called the Matthew 18 principle talks about how we should handle things within the body of Christ when we have disputes. It happens, and I just don't see that operate that often within the churches, and I think it should be a place to go. The Apostle Paul talks about it in a different way over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me read the scripture. We can't do better than that. Which one of you has a complaint against another? Do you take your complaint to a court of sinners, or do you take it to God's people? Don't you know that God's people will judge the world? And if you're going to judge the world, can't you settle small problems? Don't you know that we will judge angels? And if that is so, we could surely judge everyday matters. Why do you take everyday complaints to judges who are not respected by the church? I say this to your same. Aren't you wise enough to act as a judge between one follower and another? Why should one of you take another to be tried by unbelievers. And he finishes it up with saying, allow yourself to be defrauded. Allow mm. yourself to be cheated if necessary. Mm. Okay. But do not take one another to court, to mm. the man-made court out there. And Amen. so I hope we listen to this and yes. hear it loud and clear. Amen. Well, the one thing we can't dispute is the impact that this ministry is having on people's lives. And we're gonna teach you and show you how you can support this ministry to do more of what it's doing. We need you, and this is how you can be a blessing to CTT. Did you know TCT has a brand new app? That's right, you now have access to today's Christian television with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Enjoy TCT on all your favorite devices, whether at home or on the go. And just for signing up and downloading the new TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the new TCT app to get access to today's Christian television today. You ask the questions and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. Our production team at TCT works hard behind the scenes to produce these highly enriched programs. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. Jim from Florida calls in with this question. What are some Bible verses that can help with depression. Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. And you can text to give by sending TCT to 56512. Also, you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. You know, what we know is that none of us can be greater than all of us. And what keeps this ministry afloat is your support. So please keep us alive by calling us at 1-800-232-9855 to offer a gift or mail us at P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959, or take out your phone right now and text to give at 56512. We also want you to send us a question. So call us at 1-800-331-3552 and email us at ask 
at TCT.TV. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get back to this issue of disputes that tends to happen in marriages and families and churches. And Dr. James Baylark, what is your counsel on how Christians should deal with disagreements, arguments, and disputes? What do you think, sir? I think it's a very important question because we do have that uh, not only in the church, but also outside of the church. And uh, just to, uh, I think, uh, what Pastor Dor alluded to, I would agree with. If I can just add, though, uh, the Bible says, if you look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24, where Jesus says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before at the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift, whether we are offended party or as Matthew 18 says, or the offending party. As Matthew 5, the first step is to resolving a dispute, is to go to that person and attempt to make peace. And when you do that, that yes. works towards resolving the dispute and resolving the problem. We often say, Pastor Ward, that iron sharpens iron, but also it produces sparks. So when those sparks happen and we have disputes and disagreement, what is your counsel on how we should resolve these issues as people of God. I was actually thinking of it the same way like you just presented it. You know, first of all, we know that we should not be suing Christians. However, Christians don't always act like Christians, and that's a whole nother story. But when it comes to these sparks flying, the first place that we should look is at ourselves. You know, mm. Jesus said, if you want to remove the, the, the telephone pole out of your brother's eye, or remove rather the splinter out of your brother's eye, first check the telephone pole in your own eye. So often we think we're right and everybody else is wrong. I know there's been many times when I've had to go to the Lord to talk to the Lord about my wife. And I'm like, Lord, your daughter, she's got issues. And every time I talk to God about her, he talks to me about me. Hallelujah. So we need to stop looking at everybody else and look at ourselves. First Corinthians 1 verse 10, I believe, is a really critical scripture for every Christian. And it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. And so we need to check ourselves, we need to humble mm. ourselves, and we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Amen. You know, one of our principles at our Leadership Institute is to focus on the issue, the problem, the behavior, and never attack the person and maintain their self-worth by being honest, confronting with care. All righty, Pastor Doyle Passmore, let's go on to question number four. And this is from Tommy from Ohio. Go Buckeyes. It's uh, the theme is Jesus and little children. He asks, where in the Bible and why did Jesus say, let the little children come unto me? You want to give some insight on that particular question, sir? Pastor Passmore? Yes, I would. Uh, there's three places in the Gospels where that story is told. It's in Matthew 19, Luke 18, and Mark 10. Mark 10 is my favorite, if I can just read that for a moment. Some people brought their children to Jesus so that he could bless them by placing his hands on them. But his disciples told the people to stop bothering him. When Jesus saw this, he became angry and said, let the children come to me. Don't try to stop them. People who are like these little children belong to the kingdom of God. I promise you that you cannot get into God's kingdom unless you accept it the way that a child does. Then Jesus took the children in his arms and blessed them by placing his hands on them. Listen, uh, in a former life, I used to be a teacher in a public schools, and so I taught everything from kindergarten up to uh, senior high. And let me tell you, I saw that evolution, devolution, if you want to talk about devolution, going from the kindergarten kids who would line up when you asked them to line up and they would cooperate. Then you get up to about junior high and they're gone, man. I, you can't do anything with them at junior high. 
And uh, so I'm just thinking we've got to be like that. We've got to be forgiving. We've got to be naturally optimistic. We've got to be trusting. And most of all, we've got to be humble if we're going to get mm. into the kingdom of God. And that's the point Amen. Jesus was trying to make in that scripture. Beautifully stated. Well, Pastor James Baylark, what is your take on what does it mean to be like little children coming unto Jesus? What did that scripture mean, and how can you explain that to our friend Tommy? Well, I think uh, it's a good question, very good question, and I think uh, Pastor Doyle pretty much summed it up. I'll just add this to that, what Pastor Doyle has already shared. It's important to remember that the children in Jesus' time were not necessarily regarded as special, particularly mm. enduring except to their own parents. So many cultures today, uh, children are special, very special, sweet, innocent, and even wise. In the Jewish culture, in the days probably, they did not see children in such an optimistic term. So the mm. point is that as, as men and women of God, we must see our children as important and that we must allow them to be important to Jesus and that Jesus is important to them. And that we must continue to show them the things of righteousness, the things that Jesus did, and to bring them up in a way that is pleasing unto God, but never Amen. turn them away. Always Amen. allow them to express themselves and to be seen and to be heard. Great hermeneutical background information on the culture. Thank you. Pastor John Ward, what do you think Jesus meant by, let the little children come unto me? What's your take on that, sir? Yeah, so just to add with everything that's already been said, in uh, Luke 18, which is a scripture I use when I do baby dedications, um, he says, unless you become, uh, he said, allow the little children to come unto me for such belong the kingdom. And then we see in Matthew 18, he says, uh, the disciples came to him and said, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And then he called a little child to himself. And he said, unless you be converted and become like a little child, you'll in no way enter the kingdom of God. When I think of a little child and I think of my children, my children don't question me. My children don't think I'm lying to them. They don't doubt me. They just come very simple, very trusting. And they, you know, if my son asks for a, a glass of milk, he knows I'm going to give him a glass of milk. He's not questioning what's in it. He's not questioning whether or not it's my will to give it to him. He knows it's my good pleasure to give him everything. Thing that I have. And I think yeah. Jesus is telling us that we got to become converted like little children. And when we come to the Father, we need to come trusting and believing and saying, you're my daddy. You know, in First John, when he says, beloved, and he says, little children, little children is not just a vernacular. It's not just a, a, a little word. Little children literally means my infant darling ones. God looks at us as his mm. babies. And when we come yeah. to him, we simply need to trust him. That's beautiful. Pastor Sutton, uh, keep adding on to this perspective about what it means to be little children coming unto Jesus as such as the kingdom of God. You want to keep adding to this soliloquy? What are your thoughts, sir? Yes, sir, Dr. Archer. I, I love Matthew 19, 14, and 15, you know, where Jesus said to let the little children come to him. And, and what I think about when, when I hear those words from Jesus is that children are totally dependent on their parents, just like Pastor mm. John just said. Children depend on their parents for everything, and we should be totally dependent upon Christ. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the world we live in today, they're striving, as I mentioned earlier in the program, striving in their own strength and ability, trying mm. to prove their love for God with their good deeds. We need to come to a place where we are resting in Jesus, resting in His finished work on the cross, and just as children are totally dependent on their parents, we're totally dependent upon Christ. And I'll close with this. You know, I love what the psalmist said. He said, as a father pities his children, so the Lord has pity on those who fear him. That means they stand in reverential awe of him. And God wants us to view him as his loving father, you know, as our loving father. He's not a legalistic judge. He's not a harsh taskmaster. Like Pastor John just said, when his children ask for milk, he gives them milk. God's not a legalistic uh, judge. He's a loving father, and he wants us totally dependent on him with that childlike faith. What a beautiful portrait of our loving Father. I love Hebrews 11:6 that without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
for them that come to God must, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Kids may ask, daddy, 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 daddy. When they want something, it's not a one-time thing. They are diligent. They want to go outside. They want that chicken. They want that dessert. They want that video game. They will not shut up until you give up and give it up. And that's diligence. And that's how children respond to parents. Outstanding, guys. Okay, let's go on to our next question here. This is from Jamie from North Carolina. Her theme is like-mindedness. If we are to be like-minded, then how do we actually, in reality, practically achieve this? Dr. James Baylark, how do we get to a like-minded state in this sinful world? How do we do it? Well, Jamie, I think this is a very good question, and I think it's imperative that we identify the meaning of the word. The definition for like-minded is having similar ideas, tastes, thoughts, and opinion. And the example some would use like-minded in someone who has the same Christian views as you. In a real sense, it means to be agreeable, harmonious, agreeing to one mind, similar to the same mind together. And so one of the things that come to my mind is the like-mindedness is being patient. I think it was in Romans chapter 15 and verse 5 says, now the the God of patience and constellation grant you to be like-minded one towards another according to Jesus Christ. So again, I think it's imperative that we identify or give a definition of the meaning of the word. And as as Pastor Doyle alluded to, it's not uh, good to just look at one particular verse, but actually to look at a summary or compendium of what is being offered as he is like-minded. And there are different components than like-minded. I only gave an illustration of patience. Yes, yes, amen. Pastor John, in this day of division and disputes and my side, your side, no side, how do we bring people together to have a like-minded perspective? What is your biblical take on like-mindedness that we can help with Jamie here. Give us your biblical perspective. Great, great question, Jamie. Really appreciate it. So let's go to two scriptures. One is from Romans chapter 15, verses five and six. And he says, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one another according to Christ Jesus. Now, the Greek word for like-minded here is the Greek word phroneo. Phroneo means to exercise the mind. In other words, to think about the same thing. How do we do that? Well, we need to become like Jesus. We need to be born again. You're not going to be able to be like-minded unless you have the mind of Christ. And then you got to make a decision to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And let me just finish by reading this verse because the scripture speaks for itself. And it's Philippians chapter two, beginning with verse two. And it says, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look Mm. not everyone on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself. And that's what we have to do. Humble ourselves, Walk in love. Don't lift yourself up, but make the the effort to lift other people up. Wow, we're preaching today. I'm telling you, I'm getting excited. Well, uh, Pastor Sutton, what is your take on like-mindedness? What do you think about this scripture? I'm going to pick up right where Pastor John left off because he totally stole my thunder. Philippians 2 is is what I was thinking about when, when I heard this question. And it's an awesome question, Jamie. Thank you for asking this. And I will say, I would encourage Jamie and all of our viewers to really, really meditate and focus on Philippians 2, 1 through 8, what Pastor John just read, because it is all about humility. In order for us to be like-minded 
And, you know, a simple definition of like-minded is unity of mind and unity of heart. And so in order to have that with, with brothers and sisters, we've got to humble ourselves. And the verses that come to my mind talking about humility, like Pastor John said, we learn from the example of Jesus. He humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. And so the Bible says that God resists the proud, but mm. he gives grace to the humble. The apostle, the apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, he said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that in due time he can exalt you. Jesus said, whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. Whoever exalts themselves will be humbled and brought low. And so in order to be like-minded and to have that, that unity of heart, that unity of mind, it requires yes. <laughs> humility on our part. And sometimes that's difficult, but the Bible says, Pride goes before a fall, a haughty spirit mm. before destruction, you know, but before honor, the Bible says in Proverbs, before honor is humility. And if we want that Amen. like-mindedness, we have to humble ourselves before the Lord and humble ourselves with each other. Well, we know humility does not mean thinking, you know, less of yourself, but thinking less about yourself and thinking about others. Can you think about a way to support this great ministry, to be humble and think about how to reach people who need the gospel, who need to be encouraged, who need to be inspired? Your help, there's a video that'll show you how you can do that. Did you know TCT has a brand new app? That's right. You now have access to today's Christian television with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Enjoy TCT on all your favorite devices, whether at home or on the go. And just for signing up and downloading the new TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the new TCT app to get access to today's Christian television today. You ask the questions and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. Our production team at TCT works hard behind the scenes to produce these highly enriched programs. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. Jim from Florida calls in with this question. What are some Bible verses that can help with depression? Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. And you can text to give by sending TCT to 56512. Also, you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. Well, the Lord loves a chill forgiver, and I know you want to give cheerfully. How do you do that? You call us at 1-800-232-9855, or you can mail a gift to us at P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959, or on your phone, text to give at 56512. Now, let's get back to asking questions. You can call us with a question at 1-800-331-3552, or better yet, email us at ask at tct TV and we're live on YouTube. Okay, Dr. Passmore, Pastor Passmore, this like-mindedness issue with many things pulling us apart, many things dividing us, what allows for like-mindedness to take place, sir? Jamie from North Carolina. Good question, Jamie. How to be like-minded. It's only said, that word is only used three times that I could find in the New Testament. Romans 15, Philippians 2, twice it's used. Two times it's used to emulate Christ, like-minded to the mind of Christ. And the third time, Paul is talking about his servant Timothy, who had the same like-mindedness mindset that Paul had. He said, I know I can send Timothy to you with confidence because he thinks like me, because I think like Christ. And so that's the whole key here is to think like Christ. Now, this is what it said there. It said, for Christ did not please himself. Mm. Selah, pause on that for a moment. 
Christ did not come to please himself. He didn't come to serve. He came to be a servant. And so uh, that's how we're to be. We have the same mindset that Christ, because the word says we have the mind of Christ. Now, I want to say to this, too, as I look at the body of Christ, we've got a long way to go before we become like minded. But I'm praying through programs like this and through pastors getting on together and coming into agreement that we are becoming more like minded as Christians, as believers, as ministers and that we, too, will have the mind of Christ as he had it in his servanthood. Amen. 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 I like what Dr. Martin Luther King said, that we have come over on different ships, but that we're in the same boat now. We either learn to work together as friends or perish as fools, for a high tide can raise all of our ships. All right, let's continue on with these great questions. This is Sheila uh, from Mississippi. Crowns in heaven. What will be the crowns that we can receive in heaven? And is it important to have them there? Well, Pastor John Ward, what's your take on the bling bling in heaven, the crowns? What does that mean? Why is it valuable? Help us out. Give us some perspective. Pastor Ward. So d does a king have a crown? Absolutely. And let's see what the scripture says. Second Timothy four uh, verses six through eight. I'm not going to read it all for time's sake, but he says here, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto them also that love is appearing. We also see in the book of Revelation where the elders took off their crowns and they cast them before the Lord. So you say, well, is there a real actual crown? The answer is yes. We find in James 1 12 that there is a crown of life. We find in first Peter five, four, there is a crown of glory. And then we see in revelation chapter one, verse six, that God has made us kings and priests unto God and his father to be, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Well, a king has a crown. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10 says, And he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign with him a thousand years. And so, yes, we absolutely get a crown. Now, here's a question. Can you lose your crown? Revelation chapter 3, verses 11, Jesus is writing to the church, and he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take your crown kind of goes along with the theme today about forgiveness and about, uh, you know, how do we handle disputes and all of this? Well, Satan is trying to steal your crown from you, but when you walk in love and you walk in the spirit and we're of the same mind, uh, together, then no man will be able to take your crown six times to the churches in Asia. We see that Jesus commands us to repent seven times. He commands us to overcome. And so we need to repent. We need to overcome and let no man take our crown. Amen. Well, Pastor Sutton, what is your perspective on what is the crown and, and why is it important to have a crown and give us your perspective on the crown? Amen. I, I want to say a big amen to everything Pastor John just said. He and I are flowing in the spirit today. We're like-minded because <laughs> uh, he used some of the same verses that, that I wanted to use. But I'll just add, add to what he said by saying this. Many Christian theologians, you know, they when we talk about crowns in heaven and believers receiving crowns, you know, after, you know, we pass from this life into the next, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto mankind, you know, to die once. And after this, the judgment. And so when we, you know, those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus, there are certainly crowns, you know, awaiting us. And many Christian theologians refer to five crowns. Pastor John just mentioned those, the crown of life, the incorruptible crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing. And I want to just, with my remaining time, read what he referenced, Revelation 4, 10, and 11 what he talked about with the elders. It says the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. So yes, there are crowns laid up for us in heaven. 
And as Pastor John said, I will say, yes, it is important for us to look forward to receiving those because we're going to lay them down at the feet of Jesus and honor him because he's the one who's truly worthy. Amen. Pastor Passmore, what is your take on crowns and why are they important and why we will have them? What is your position on this, sir? Well, exactly right, Pastor Sutton. Uh, you named five of the crowns. I've actually located 30 crowns throughout the Bible. There's a lot of crowns we're talking about. One that I'd like to pinpoint just a little bit is that crown of glory that's mentioned in 1 Peter 5 and 4. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, you'll see very quickly that it's talking to ministers in that particular. I think it's only ministers that may have access to that crown of glory. He says to church leaders, I'm writing to encourage you as a leader talking to leaders. Shepherds, watch over the sheep. You must watch over everyone God has placed in your care. Do it willingly in order to please God and not simply because you think you must. Let it be something you want to do instead of something you do merely to make money. Hello, did you hear it, <laughs> ministers? Not just to make money. Don't be bossy to those people who are in your care, but set an example for them. Then when Christ, the chief shepherd, returns, you will be given a crown that will never lose its glory. Listen, that's what I the point I want to make to Sheila in Michigan. Sheila, listen, this is an incorruptible, incorruptible crown. It's never going to lose its shine, never going to lose its glory, unlike the medals and such things and trophies we have here on earth. Put the kingdom of God first, Sheila. Amen. Pastor Balark, what's your position on crowns and why they're important in the Bible? Uh, very, very important question, Sheila. Uh, and, you know, most of Christians are just trying to get into the kingdom. But here we have the, the, the uh, rewards. And, and, I, and as Pastor Sutton and Pastor Ward and Pastor Dor has already alluded to, that there are the five crowns uh, that will be awarded to the believers. And they are the imperishable. And then there is the rejoicing. And then there is the righteous and the crown of glory. And, of course, the crown of life. Now, the Greek word translated crown is Stephanos which basically when you think about Stephen and, and his life and how he stood before the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the, the council, uh, but it means that a badge of royalty, a prize in the public games or a symbol of honor, uh, generally speaking. And it was used in the ancient Greek time uh, where the, the garland of the leaves were placed on the victor's head as a reward for winning an athletic uh, contest. So again, uh, going back to uh, what Pastor Dora alluded to, the, the focus is on doing what you are supposed to do, whether you are a minister or whether you are lay. And God will determine exactly everything that you are going to receive. And this is why we go to the Lord uh, secretly. Yes. And he will reward us openly. Amen. And so our focus should be on doing what thus says the Lord and let the crown fall where it may. All right. We're heading to our rapid fire section of the program, giving a pithy, concise, dynamic answer. It's to this question. Philippians 2.24. Did Paul in this scripture have the truest hope of God while he was in prison? Let's take a minute and give a rapid fire answer to this person from Florida named Charles. Okay, Pastor Sutton, you can begin rapid fire. Yes, sir. In 224, he said, I trust in the Lord that I also myself will come shortly. He had he had an expectation that he, you know, that he was going to be released. And that that became a reality because he was released a short time after that. And I think it's important for us to expect. You know, God is listening. He hears our prayers, and we've got to keep our hope, our faith, and our trust in him. Amen. Good job. Pastor Passmore, rapid fire. What do you think uh, Paul meant in 224 Philippians? Well, I think he meant that he had this hope here on earth, that he would come and see them again. And I love Paul's attitude. I said earlier in the, the programs in January who was my favorite Bible character, was Apostle Paul. I mean, the guy just could not be brought low. He couldn't be brought down. 
uh, and discouraged. He even in prison, and it wasn't a nice prison by any means that he was right. in, but he believed he was going to be restored to the church and restored to the brothers. But he also had this great eternal hope that he would be in the heavens. He would be in the eternals someday as well. That hope is one that never leaves us as believers in Christ. Amen. Rapid fire. Well, Pastor Balark, what do you think about uh, Philippians 2.24? Give us your take. Yeah, Charles, this is a very good question. And uh, I'm reminded that Paul, on his way to Damascus, was met by Jesus Christ because of the things that he was doing. And be, he became saved. And the Lord saved him from all the, the dangers that he was doing. And so he trusted in the Lord. And so yes. when you look at this particular passage, we realize that Paul knew exactly uh, what was going on. And he trusted the Lord with all his heart, all his mind, and all his soul. And he was willing to die mm. for the Lord. Amen. Pastor Ward, rapid fire. What's your take on Philippians 2.24? Praise God. Well, if you back up to chapter one, Paul makes this statement. He says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation, the Greek word soteria, which means deliverance through your prayer. And Thank you. I appreciate it, Pastor. Let's go on to Pastor Sutton as we go down rapid fire, the last five minutes of the program. This is a personal question for you as we wrap up the program. There's a lot of confusion out here about vaccines, are you going to take a vaccine? What do you think about it? Give us a 30-second answer. What are your thoughts about all this vaccine stuff? What are you going to do, and what would you encourage others? Pastor Sutton, 30 seconds. For myself personally, I, I, I'm not taking the vaccine. I never get a flu shot, and okay. I don't plan on getting the COVID shot. And as far as other people, I say, you know, that's between, between them and the Lord. They need to seek him and 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 follow his leading. For me, no vaccine. <laughs> gotcha. All right. That's one. Okay. Uh, Pastor Passmore, what's your take on the whole vaccine thing? Are you going to take it? And what do you think others should do? We spoke about this in our Thursday night uh, prayer meeting and Bible study last night. And this yes. was my advice to all of the people in our church is don't be judgmental toward anybody. Some people are going to have huge amounts of faith and said, I'm not taking it. Other people's faith is going to be on a different level, and they say, I'm going to take it. But let's not be fighting at mm. disunifying uh, with one another Preach. and letting the devil take this thing and divide us in the yes. name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Balark, what's your take? Vaccine, no vaccine, and what's your counsel? 30 seconds, sir. Well, it's a very good question, and it requires due diligence. It requires research. You have to research and get all the particulars uh, in the decision-making process. And, of course, uh, we must pray and ask the Lord to guide us and direct us under the guise of the Holy Spirit. And yes. the Holy Spirit will guide you whether or not if you are to take the, the vaccination or not to take the vaccination. Amen. But the choice is up to the individual. But the key to what we are all doing and have been done is research to make sure Amen. you understand what's being injected into your body. Amen. Pastor Ward, last one. What do you think about this whole vaccination thing as a pastor? I agree. Yeah, I agree 100%. You got to be led by the Spirit. And Romans tells us that anything that's not of faith is sin. So you need to pray about it. You need to be in faith. As for me personally, man, I'll absolutely get the vaccine. I was a paramedic. I've been in the medical field for years. Uh, I'm a missionary. I travel in the field. I've had every vaccine known to man. I was a pincushion at one time, yellow fever. I mean, every <laughs> vaccine you can think of. And I'm still yes. doing pretty well, praise God. And so God gave doctors and God gave us science and medicine. And what the vaccine does is it builds your immune system up. So absolutely, I think it's a great yes. thing. Well, to make it clear, this is not a medical show and we're not doctors. We are pastors who are giving a spiritual perspective. So we're not telling you what to do, what not to do from a medical standpoint. We're just giving you a perspective from the word of God on how we deal with the circumstances in our environment. So we want to thank our panel of tremendous pastors who know how to bring the word of God 
the Rightly Divided inspire us. And thank you all for watching us and being a part of Ask the Pastor. And remember, we cannot do this without your financial support. We need you to give and support us. 1-800-232-9855. You can call us with a gift or you can mail us at P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959, or take out your cell phones and text to give at 56512. I just want to tell you that we are so excited about your questions and that it's okay to ask and to be vulnerable and to be transparent. We want to be able to provide a biblical perspective and to understand the first step in getting answers is to pray and to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The thief on the cross said, remember me. He cried out and said, it doesn't matter your background, what you've been through, how bad you've been. God died for your hangups. He wants you to call on him so he can adopt you into his family. It's time to come home. It's time to be a part of the family. It's time to repent, which means to turn around and say, you know what? I know people have been praying for me, my mother, my grandmother, my pastor, but you must make a decision and come to the enlightenment that you need Jesus. And for those of you who know Jesus and want to rededicate your life to him, go back to to church, talk to your pastor, repent of anything you've done wrong, and God will run to you with open arms. He loves you. He loves you so much, he would die again for you. Just say, Father, help me, because there's power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Jesus is Lord, Savior, and he's our Redeemer. We give God all the glory. <clears throat> if we lift him up, we'll draw he will draw all men unto himself. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is Savior. God bless you, and thanks for watching Ask the Pastor. Ask the Pastor is a TCT Network production and is made possible by your financial gifts. If you have questions or comments, write Ask the Pastor, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959 or email us at ask at tct.tv. Thanks for watching.